Hello everybody, it's John Legend here. I'm going to invite Heather McGee to join us. We're going to talk about her new book, The Some of Us. One second. Sending the request. Waiting for Heather. I encourage everyone to check out the book. It's really powerful and helpful in understanding American politics and how race and racism and racial politics have uh, held us back as a nation. Waiting for Heather. What's everybody up to? Did everyone have a nice weekend? Maybe a nice Valentine's Day? I'm just looking for Heather here. I love all of you. Okay, Heather says she's here. It says I'm waiting for you and you're unable to join. Let me try to ask you again. Here it goes. We there did you are. It. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome. I'm so glad to be with you, John. Where are you right now? Um, I'm in Brooklyn, New York. All right. Brooklyn, New York. I'm in Los Angeles. And through the magic of Instagram Live, here we are together. And we're going to talk about your new book. I am so excited to talk about this with everyone. I think it's such a helpful book for understanding um, what's happening in America, what's happened over the past few decades and centuries. And, and uh, as you put it, why we can't have nice things. <laughs> <laughs> so first of all, introduce yourself to folks that may not follow politics on the regular or you know, see you on NBC, MSNBC hits and all these things. Uh, Explain who you are and how you come to this work. Well, thank you so much, John, first of all, for sharing, for reading the book, right? It just came out today. It's so wonderful to have this conversation I've been having by myself now open up to the world and to people like you and to have it be two-way and 6,000-way. It's really wonderful. So I'm a person who believes in the power of the people to get good things done for all of the people. And so I work in public policy, trying to research the big problems that are facing American people and families, things like student debt, poverty wages, um, the flaws in our democracy, climate change, healthcare, all of these big vexing public problems. And I've been doing it for almost 20 years. Um, I go on TV and talk about it, um, mm -hmm. but really, is trying to answer this question, as you said, why can't we seem to have nice things? Yes. And I don't like, you know, flying cars and laundry that does itself. I mean, universal health care and reliable infrastructure in places like Texas, where the grid is not performing and, and leaving people out in the cold, things like universal health care and a well-functioning democracy. And talk about the idea of a public good, what that means, um, because you know, a lot of people think about their own capacity to make money, their own capacity to earn money, their own capacity to do for themselves and for their family. Um, but there's this thing that's happening all the time, whether you're paying attention to it or not, and our taxes are going to pay for it. Um, and uh, there's infrastructure around it. There's all kinds of things uh, that comprise public goods. Uh, yeah. Talk about what that means. So public goods are the things that we rely on that are investments in us, in our people, in our communities, in our families that happen because there are some things that we simply can't do on our own. I can't build an electric grid. I can't make a healthcare system. I can't build uh, public schools in my neighborhood. I can't create a library on my own. These are all the things that we all need that we sort of hold in common between us. And these are the public goods that 
the United States discovered really in the 20th century, if you invest in these things, if you spend public money to create these public goods, the benefits compound three, four, five dollars for every dollar invested. And we are shortchanging ourselves. When I talked about those nice things we can't seem to have in the book, the sum of us, I realized that a big part of it is that we have stopped investing in those public goods that we desperately need. Provide examples of, of what that looks like in everyday life. You talk a lot about the pool, uh, the public pool, and that becomes kind of like a metaphor, the idea of draining that pool. Um, talk about what that story is about, how racism plays into that story, and then how it affected the entire community. So I didn't really know this until I started reaching, researching the Some of Us, but this country used to have nearly 2,000 grand resort-style public free swimming mm -hmm. pools. Communities across the country, these were public goods paid for by tax dollars that we built in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. And they were sort of a you know, it's an everyday symbol, right? It's not as important maybe as, you know, a school system, but it is so important. And it was this kind of symbol of government's commitment to a decent standard of life. And in many places across the country, those public pools were not so public. They were actually segregated or mm -hmm. whites. And then in the 1950s and 60s, when the civil rights movement empowered black community members to say, you know, those are our tax dollars funding those public schools. We want our kids to swim too. So many towns across the country, and I think it's important, not just in the American South, in Ohio, in Washington State, in West Virginia, drained their public pools rather than integrate them. Integrate them. They so they'd rather drained. not swim publicly if I have to swim with a black person. That's exactly right. And so, of course, you know, that means that the white community members lost out on a public good as well. Mm -hmm. And I use that story of the drained public pool as a metaphor to describe in many ways what's happened to our entire country since integration. We used to have the formula in this country for a broadly shared prosperity, for just an everyday person to be able to count on a secure middle class job good retirement, good health care. We used to be able to go to college for free because the government paid the cost of state schools and public colleges. And all that began to shift in the 1970s. So we have now the inequality that I think we all know is really holding so many Americans back. And, and when for you me, say, though, the we didn't include us. And, and, and when it started threatening to include us, that's when these public goods started to disappear. So explain kind of kind of what that process was like outside of the pool meta uh, pool example and metaphor. That's right. Um, here's a really concrete example. Um, in the 1950s and 60s, 70 percent, almost 70 percent of white Americans thought that the government ought to provide a job for anyone who wanted one, who couldn't find one in the private sector. And guarantee a minimum income in the country so that nobody would fall into poverty. This is because the government had been this force for economic good in white people's lives. So they were very pro-government, way left, right, in our current way of thinking about it. Those are pretty radical left-wing ideas today. Yeah, um, the South was huge supporters of FDR, for instance. Southern it, white are huge supporters of FDR. Exactly. So it was this sort of New Deal Democrat, the idea that government could be a force for good. But there was this asterisk, right, that said, we've experienced that only as being really benefiting white people. And I talk in the book, the some of us, I talk about all the kind of free stuff that white families enjoyed that was the springboard for their prosperity in their middle class lives that were cordoned off and really exclusive. Um, and, and not given to black families and denied them. And so what happened was between 1960 and 1964, the level of support for that idea, guaranteed job and guaranteed income, fell in half from nearly 70% of black people to just 35%. So and what was like, in America around that time that would precipitate that decline? <laughs> exactly. What happened was the civil rights movement burst into the public consciousness of white Americans, right? We had the March on Washington in 63, between 60 and 64. 
which actually included black activists on the mall and their demands included those kinds of economic guarantees going to all Americans, regardless yeah. of color. And I and want to- uh, At the end of his life, a lot of his marches were around uh, union rights, workers' rights, poor people's marches. And so he was saying, uh, not only do we want equality, we, but we want all of us to be treated better by our government and, and be accorded certain uh, rights, but also um, a certain social safety net um, uh, that we believe is healthier for a, a, a great society. That's exactly right. There was this vision, this sort of early Rainbow Coalition vision that actually the country had enough resources mm -hmm. to make sure everyone had a decent life. Yeah. And, you know, I think it's important to think, okay, why is it that the majority of white Americans really were so ambivalent about the idea of sharing the prize of America that we've all worked to achieve um, with their black and brown neighbors? And I think it's important to note that white Americans at that time, and, and to a large degree still today, have been receiving a lot of negative stories about who we are, um, about- That means. Yeah, about the idea, they've really been taught to disdain and to distrust black and brown people. This idea that we, we take more than we give to society. And two thirds of white Americans agree with that statement, which is just, boggling to me today. but it's, yes today oh. it's these negative stereotypes this makers and takers this the idea of taxpayers and freeloaders this idea that people who are maybe struggling economically are there's something wrong with them it's not that there's something wrong with the system it's often unconscious but it shows up in political attitudes I know that you are very get very involved in elections because you believe in the power of people to come together and make our lives better Mm -hmm. I don't know if everybody listening knows that no Democrat has actually won the White House. I'm sorry, won, no Democrat has running for president has won the majority of the white vote yeah. since Lyndon Johnson signed the Civil Rights Act, since the Civil Rights Movement said, we're going to be the Democratic Party, the party of civil rights. White Americans did a huge shift and turned away from the party. And that exists to this day. So the central thesis of your book is that we've all been taught that race and racial politics are a zero sum situation. Uh, that if one race gains, the other loses, and we can't all win together. We can't all have a win-win situation. Uh, that's been the, the central myth and the central story that's kind of uh, crippled American politics for a long time. That's the story of your book. and you argue that this zero-sum myth, this zero-sum uh, framing has made us do all sorts of things that are detrimental for everybody. Um, yes. And some have also argued, though, that there are real tangible benefits from white privilege, from whiteness, from uh, that, that racism has accorded to whiteness in America. So how do you talk about that thing where you know we see them on twitter it's like a genre on twitter where people say here's how the white guy got treated by the police here's how the black guy got treated here's uh here's uh how whiteness kind of privileges all these sorts of interactions that you have whether it's uh having an appraiser come to your house and value your house correctly or or uh, or how your uh application is perceived when it it, it arrives at, at a hiring office all sorts of benefits that appear to accrue to people because of the color of their skin how do you at once believe that that's the case, but also believe that racism costs white people as well? Yeah, the, the, so well said. Um, the idea of my book, it's called The Sum of Us, What Racism Costs Everyone and How We Can Prosper Together, is that, of course, there is such a thing as white privilege. The idea that white people, because of their skin color and because of how they're treated interpersonally and because of you know, the laws and policies and systemic racism have certain privileges. They're less afraid of the police. They have more access to health care. Their schools are better funded. But those are privileges that are not afforded in large part to most working and middle class black and brown people. But it's not a zero sum. Mm -hmm. Racial 
advocates don't want to take away those privileges from white people. We want everyone to have them too. We think that that's the minimum treatment you should have in society. Everyone should have health care. Everyone should not be afraid of the police. Everyone should have well-funded schools. And so this idea that is really marketed and sold, right, this us versus them, winners and losers, makers and takers, it's a lie. It's always been a lie. It was invented by the worst elements of our society um, to really sort of justify the original economic system in this country of stolen land, stolen people, and stolen labor. And we can let go of it because it's not serving us anymore. In fact, so the racial does it are serve. costing us. Serve. Who does it serve? It serves the people who are doing extremely well in a high concentration of wealth and power in this country. It has always been a tool of the self-interested elite to divide working people who have so much in common from each other just along lines of race. This really is the key. I began to see in the journey that I took to write The Sum of Us what I began to call solidarity dividends, these mm -hmm. gains we can have if white, black, and brown people work together across lines of race to find common solutions to our common problems, whether it's higher wages or cleaner air or better funded schools, we can achieve them, but racism is what's holding us back. Talk about how this has played out in our school system. Uh, schools are still extremely segregated, just, just about as segregated as they were um, back around uh, Brown versus Board of Education. And we haven't seen a lot of progress in that area. And we've seen uh, in, a, uh, in a lot of places and underinvestment in, in the public education system, uh, the rise of a completely separate private education system uh, that uh, a lot of folks put a lot of their own personal money into, uh, and despite the fact they're still paying taxes to fund the public school uh, system. Talk about how this, uh, how this uh, zero sum uh, situation has played out in weakening our public education system. The Some of Us includes a whole chapter on the cost of segregation. It's called Living Apart. It's this idea that government has actually been the main enforcer of segregation throughout our history. It kind of gives a very quick history of how it is that we live so apart, that the average American, white American lives in a neighborhood that's 75% white, and that people actually want to live in more diverse neighborhoods and end up really still so segregated, and how that shows up in our school system. There's huge economic divides, $23 billion more goes to the average mostly white school district versus the average mostly folks of color school district. And that's largely because of our funding systems, which are on top of inequities in our property values, which come to us because history shows up in your wallet, because black and brown people were not allowed to buy houses for most of the 20th century. So all of that inequity we normally think of as, you know, terrible for black and brown students who are sort of locked out of, of white schools. Mm -hmm. But I look at the flip side of it and ask the question, what are white students who are living in these white segregated neighborhoods and not learning about their brothers and sisters and fellow Americans, what is it costing them? And I talked to parents who had decided to opt out of the segregated good school they were supposed to go to and mm -hmm. put the children in diverse, what they call global majority, because that's what we are, people of color, global majority schools. And it turns out that the social science research shows that those schools, integrated schools, particularly for white children, are actually much better at teaching them critical thinking and empathy and so many of the skills that are needed to thrive in a diverse America. So we're all better off in integrated environments where we're learning from each other, growing together, uh, um, experiencing different cultural influences, and uh, our schools are better off if, if that's able to happen. That's right. Uh, so when you think about all the costs that we've incurred in our society because we haven't wanted to live together uh, in an equitable society, um, how do you think about the future? How do you think about what we can do to make an affirmative argument for um, why there's a better way. I wrote this book because I love this country. Mm -hmm. I love, you know, we're a young country. Um, mm -hmm. We are 
quickly becoming a country with no racial majority. And I believe that when that happens, we will be truly creating a new world. Um, mm -hmm. When a country like ours that was founded on this lie, this belief in that some groups of people are better than others, a, a racial hierarchy just really actually lets go of that belief, which is, I think, what is happening slowly but surely in society. I think the potential is boundless. I think this is our destiny as a nation. By finding that racism is really the common denominator in so many of our vexing public problems, from climate change to poverty wages to um, you know, underfunded schools and student debt, the student debt crisis. I see how I locate how racism is driving that, the lack of affordable health care. Wait, left can, me you explain, can you explain the student debt situation? I feel yes, like I it's can. A major, uh, it's a major issue for so many people. And, and, and I don't think a lot of people realize that uh, some of its roots are in the same conversation. Yeah. So um, in The Some of Us, my book, I talk about how college, public college, used to be free, virtually free, mm -hmm. because the government paid for it. It was a wise investment. It wasn't charity. States funded most of the cost of colleges, and then you could get a grant from the federal government, not a loan that had to be repaid with interest. And yeah. that happened when the college-going population was white. This was one of those public goods that mm -hmm. had that asterisk, as I was saying before, that white's only asterisk to it. And when, around when the civil rights movement, when more black and brown people and women started going to public colleges, lawmakers suddenly decided they weren't so interested in continuing to invest more and more and more in state colleges. It's part of that sort of subtle unconscious racism, but it's also part of that anti-government ethos that became more popular among white voters so that they were voting actually essentially to raise their tuition bills by voting for, you know, tax cuts for the rich, voting for cuts in state school spending. And that's where we're left today, where all students, the majority of them are borrowing to go to college. It's crushing our economic progress. It's a cost of racism to everyone. And in fact, we know the formula to do better. And we can do it. We can fund public college so that everyone can graduate without debt. Mm. So this is another um, policy prescription that um, could be publicly shared um, that we used to have uh, with the asterisk. <laughs> um, <laughs> and if, if we opened up our hearts and opened up our minds to the idea that we can all experience and enjoy this, this kind of baseline of, of public good and public benefit and, and things that we share and invest in together, then we can all have nicer things. That's as right. <laughs> now talk about other countries. I've seen, you know, um, you know, I've seen some analysis that when countries don't have to deal with this issue of a caste system or, or a, 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 a heterogeneous uh, population, they they do better when it comes to taking care of each other because they see themselves in the poorest in their community. They see themselves in the working class in their community. And is it, are we doomed because we're so uh, heterogeneous in America to not see ourselves in each other? Such a good question, John. That is a good snapshot of the way it is today, right? That more diverse countries where, particularly where the power structure is only, you know, is, is dominated by one of those you know, ra racial and ethnic groups as our power structure here is in the United States. Almost 90% of elected officials in the United States are white, despite you know, growing diversity. But that doesn't, that isn't the way it has to be. And I really do believe that there is a promise in this country that we are glimpsing, but have not yet grasped. And that's the promise that the proximity of so much difference, right? We are in a nation where there is somebody here with a tie to every single community on the globe. We could have neighbors of every race and hue, every background, every language. And as we are becoming more and more diverse, I believe we could let the proximity of so much difference reveal our common humanity. Mm -hmm. I mean, 
We, you and I both love across lines of race and difference and origin and ethnicity. And it's a beautiful thing, right? You realize what connects you when you're not divided by something as shallow as your background. Um, that's what I found all over the country. When I met people who had linked up arms, whether it was workers fighting for a raise or communities, people in communities fighting to clean up their air and take on polluters, when they had found common cause with somebody who was different from them and connected on core values, not on skin color and culture, they were transformed. They were empowered. They were impervious to the nonsense political stories of us versus them. I think that's who we're becoming as a country. But I think there's some resistance and backlash to it. And it's coming from the elite who want to keep things exactly as they are. Now, um, I think this has been talked about a lot, the idea that we can unite when it comes to class. Uh, we, can, you, we can unite when it comes to class and when it comes to economic solidarity. And that can transcend racial divisions. That's been theorized, I, I feel like, for quite a long time. And then it, it always feels like it never really uh, comes together because people end up voting their identity um, in, in other ways, other, form, or other, other parts of their identity, rather than their class solidarity. Um, what do you think is the best way for an organizer or a politician or anyone who's thinking about trying to bring people together in this way to, to pitch this to, to the interested parties? So I was really heartened to see that the first time President Biden spoke about race as president, he explicitly called out the zero sum. He said I've that- I've been reading your book. <laughs> maybe, I don't know. I don't know, I didn't see it on his nightstand, but I know that a lot of people around him had copies of it. Let's put it okay. that way. <laughs> um, but I think it's important to call out, right? We just went through four years of someone for whom the zero sum was his entire worldview. You're with mm -hmm. your winners and losers, us versus them. So we've got to actually just name the elephant in the room and say, you know what? Racism costs everyone. White Americans, you're not gonna lose because your neighbor has you know, his or her life improved. A dollar in her pocket does not mean a dollar out of yours. You don't need to root for them to stay down so that you can come up. In mm -hmm. fact, racism is costing everyone. I think that's an important part of the story that we've neglected to our peril. Um, you know, obviously, John, I can't sit here as the descendant of enslaved people and say that racism doesn't hit the target first, right? First and worst, Black and Brown people and Indigenous people still bear the brunt and the burden of racism, but it's an illusion to think that the harm can be contained to the targeted communities. We are in an integrated system. When you attack our democracy to suppress the votes of brown and black people, you make it harder for white young people to vote as well. Um, mm -hmm. When you pollute one neighborhood, it means that the neighborhood right next to it also has dirtier air than if you would just come together and said, you know what, stop polluting at these levels at all. Um, yeah. These are there are so many examples. The financial crisis is an example in my book of, of racist discriminatory lending that ended up snowballing and almost taking down the global economy. We are so connected. We are so connected. And, and I think if everyone reads this book and takes anything from it, it's the idea that we are really connected and we all are better off when we have a more loving society, a more healthy society, uh, a society where we see ourselves in each other and root for each other to succeed because someone else succeeding does not mean you fail. It means we all we all rise together. So um, thank you, Heather. Thank you so much. I'm so happy you, you spent the time to put all of your thoughts and your research into this beautiful book. That was, I, I think, a, a wonderful story that can be really helpful and really instructive for ordinary citizens, for policymakers, for anybody who wants this country to be a better place. Thank you for spending some time with us. Thank you for explaining some of these concepts to all of my followers. And uh, I'm rooting for your book to do really well and be read and heard about by so many people.
Dom, thank you so much for all that you do, for your activism, for your voice, for your heart and your passion, and for sharing this really enriching conversation. I learned some things. I'm so excited. The book is called The Sum of Us. It's available wherever books are sold. Thank you all so much for listening today. Thank you, Heather. Thank you, John. Take care, everybody. Take care. Be safe. Be well, everybody.